Verse one says that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation, it's an interesting word in the Greek, it's apokalypsis, where we get our word apocalypse. And so people get all excited, ooh, the apocalypse, isn't that a movie? Uh, isn't that something we should have nuclear weapons detonating and uh, multi-particle beams being blown up and electromagnetic pulse weapon? People get all interested in all that. And it is interesting to see what's going on in the world, but when it says the ap uh, apocalypse or the apocalypse, uh, the word apocalypse, the Greek word, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means the unveiling or the revealing. So the very beginning of this book is really saying the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that really is the goal. In fact, the spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. We read uh, that scripture from the end of the book of Revelation just uh, as we were introducing this book. And so it is tempting to, uh, you know, just get into the end time stuff and, and forget. But today we're going to cover some kind of hardcore end times notions and ideas and controversies even. And then the goal is to get it back to what it's all about, and that is Jesus Christ. So if you're willing, uh, strap on your eschatological safety belt, uh, and here we go. Uh, that is eschatological, it's just a fancy word of saying the study of end times. And different people and different churches, good churches, good pastors, good people, have varying views on their eschatology or their study of, or, or belief in the way the end times is gonna unfold. And so oftentimes the believer uh, hears all the different views and starts to get kind of frustrated and, and says, man, it's just too confusing and there's no real agreement on the end times and all that. And so we should not even bother. We'll let the theologians hammer it out. Uh, we're just gonna pray that we don't get killed. Uh, or we're just gonna pray that we survive or go to heaven and just, we'll just call it good. But here's the problem with that, that kind of uh, passive view. The Bible says, be not ignorant of the things concerning the end times. Bible tells us that. Uh, of all the things, there's only five real notions in the Bible that says we're not to be ignorant about. Two of the five have to do with end times. One is just not being ignorant of the signs and the seasons, the times we're living in, but also not to be ignorant concerning the nation Israel. And those two uh, notions have very much to do with end times things. So what I wanna do, uh, hopefully, uh, and I'm gonna need help from the Holy Spirit on this one, to, I'm gonna show you the, the various views uh, and try to divide up the big ones, the main ones, so you kind of know what people are saying out there. And the reason uh, I'm gonna do that, I haven't really spent a lot of time with that in the past, but the reason I wanna do that is to show you as, it's almost like to set the stage for you to say, okay, here's the views, but then as we go through the book of Revelation, I believe you will very naturally see why I hold the view that I do, and perhaps uh, I can nudge you uh, into what I believe, and that is the pre-trib, pre-millennial, view of the way the end times will unfold. That's, that's my personal persuasion. So before we read the single verse, because I believe the verse that we're gonna look at today really largely should solve the problem altogether and, and very much gives clarity. Um, while other groups and other views will say, oh man, it's a tough thing to talk about, it's difficult. The, Reve the book of Revelation is a hugely intense and difficult book to understand, so much so few churches will actually go verse by verse through the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and to me, it's a bummer. It's a total bummer because I think the book of Revelation is one of the easiest books in all the Bible. And I'm not saying that because I'm brilliant or smart. I'm just saying it really is. <clears throat> if you understand that the book comes uniquely with two things, two characteristics this little book of Revelation in the back of your Bible has. And by the way, remember when, when uh, you were a kid? I remember when math books started coming with the answers in the back of the book. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> uh, so you young people think that's the way they always came. They didn't. Uh, I remember math books that had no answers. But I remember thinking, man, some dupe figured out that it would be a good thing to put the answers in the back of the book. And I was thinking that's, you know, but uh, I, I didn't really learn math very well that way, but at least I knew I was 50-50 because -50, usually they'd put every other answer. Remember that? Every other in the back. I was like, man, some, they should have just gone all the way, you know? Well, the answers were in the back of the book. Well, in the same way, the Bible, I believe, has the answers in the back of the book. 
Uh, you remember the disciples sat there on the Mount of Olives with Jesus in Matthew 24 and said, what are the signs of the end? And when's the end of the world? And when's it all gonna come down? And then Jesus gave what we call to be the Olivet Discourse. Powerful and important. So Matthew 24 is Jesus uh, going for quite some lengthy sermon on the way the end is gonna look, how it's gonna feel. And so some of the major New Testament scriptures would include Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation as it relates to the end of all things or the end of time or the end of the world or the last days. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 24, uh, John the apostle in the book of Revelation. We've got some in Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. We have some discussion about end times. But here's the deal. The churches sort of disagree in many places uh, about the way this is to be interpreted. And so it largely has to do with the main events and when they're uh, placed. Uh, now, let me just remind you, this is an important thing, that varying views of eschatology or end time study, uh, it's okay. Uh, there's a lot of good people, and, and I, want, I want to stress that, that, that this is an in-house debate. Uh, those of us that love Jesus and, and believe that he died on the cross for our sins, that we're saved by the grace of God, we can have these uh, discussions, and it should be a blessing to be able to talk about them and, and talk through them. And I've got good friends and even family members that I talk to about uh, these varying views or have a very different view than I hold. And so uh, it's all good. But you'll, you'll guess as we get going, I'm, I'm very persuaded, so much so that I, I like to sh uh, really share pre-trib, pre-millennial view uh, with, with as much strength as I can because, man, it, it, to me, it very much makes sense. And the verse that we have before us will, I think, clarify very much what, what that's all about. So here's the deal. You've got, you've got some main events. You, you, you hear people kick around these notions, the rapture of the church. You hear people talk about uh, the tribulation period. If you've been around the church long enough, you'll hear people talk about the millennial kingdom uh, and the new heavens and the new earth and stuff like that. Have you guys heard those terms? Yeah. Okay, so the, the big thing is uh, where do those things lie? And what order do they fall? And so that's really the, the main deal. Uh, so you have, uh, as far as the millennium, that's, that's, that's probably one, the, the single uh, section of time that the Bible talks about that people don't really agree on where that millennium is or what it is even. So you have very views. You have the post-millennial view. And what that is, is that they believe that Christ, his second coming, uh, his return to this earth to rule and reign, they believe it comes at the end of the millennial kingdom, that thousand year. Millennium, it means thousand. And there is a, a thousand year reign talked about in Revelation chapter 20. And it says it's a thousand years there. And so the, the post-millennial uh, view is that Christ will return at the end of that millennial age. And, uh, and so then there's another group that believes in what they, that's post-millennial. The second group is amillennial. And the word ah, uh, it means no, <laughs> it, no millennium. And what that is, the amillennialist believes in no literal millennial kingdom. They believe it's more of a figurative sort of notion. In fact, it's, it's interesting because as you look at the uh, amillennial view, uh, what, what you realize is uh, there's, there's some variations within amillennialism. It's a view of that, um, that uh, there's no literal thousand year period where Jesus will have a physical reign on earth. The amillennial view holds that a thousand years that's mentioned in Revelation 20 is only a symbolic number uh, and not a literal description. Um, uh, and many believe that the millennium has actually already begun, that we are, they would say we are currently living in the millennial kingdom. Um, uh, uh, or more rarely, uh, some of them believe that it uh, ended, the millennial kingdom ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And that has to do with more of a view uh, called preterism. Preterism, that's kind of linked in a way to all millennial view, but the preterist view, and you, maybe you've heard of this, it, it's uh, preter, it just means past. And basically that's derived from the Latin. It, it, they believe that the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 24, as well as the book of Revelation were all fulfilled uh, in AD 70 when Jerusalem was conquered by Rome, uh, led by the conqueror, General Titus. And uh, so uh, they believe that the churches of Asia Minor were prior to the Jewish 
War, A.D. 66 to A.D. 70. So the preterist has to say that the book of Revelation was actually written uh, more like 60-something A.D. and not 90 or even 100 uh, A.D. as most, most people believe it to be. So the preterist and, and the omelette t- tends to take all the Bible prophecies figuratively. You don't take those things literally uh, and, uh, unless you're applying them to uh, what happened in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, let me just give you a little freebie for you. One of the main reasons I'm not an amillennialist or a preterist is because uh, Bible prophecy, that is the Lord speaking of future events, so far in history, the prophecies of the Bible, interestingly enough, came to pass quite literally. Uh, even you know our Savior Jesus Christ, there were prophecies concerning a man who would be born in Bethlehem, uh, who would uh, ride a donkey into Jerusalem, uh, and the prophecy even of Daniel chapter nine, they could have known the very day when he would ride in Jerusalem, quite literally, and that's why Jesus wept over Jerusalem as he's riding the donkey. He says, "Oh Jerusalem, if you would have known in this thy day, he, you could have known really the day that I was coming." How is that? Because Bible prophecy was literally fulfilled. And so I'm one who takes the Bible very literally, and I think it's rewarding. Uh, What's interesting, by the way, is many of the prophecies as it relates to end times has to do with the nation Israel. And if you were on this earth studying your Bible even 100 years ago, it would have been a hard thing to see the literal uh, fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And you'd have to say, no, these must be figurative because there's so much about the nation Israel. And 100 years ago, The nation of Israel didn't even exist because in AD 70, uh, all the Jews were scattered out of Jerusalem uh, and uh, they went to, you know, ultimately uh, parts of Arabia and and in even uh, Iraq and up in Russia and New York City. They ended up, there's more Jews in New York City than almost anywhere on the earth other than Israel. And so they, they were scattered all over the earth for a couple thousand years. So when you read Martin Luther, for example, who lived several hundred years ago. He was an amillennialist because he didn't see a literal Israel and he didn't see, they were, they'd been gone for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So how do you take that literally? But I believe the uh, amillennialist should have changed his notes, should have looked and the preterist should have taken another look when Israel became a nation again, May 14th, 1948, Israel was uh, declared a nation again, given their old homeland, It's funny how the world calls them occupiers, even though they were there millennia ago. That was their land given by God to Abraham. Uh, It's a funny thing that the world is arguing this whole point. But what's interesting is the Bible says the world would argue over Jerusalem. And there's a prophecy, I mean, the prophecies are so specific. Israel would be gathered, their language of Hebrew would be lost, the Bible says, which it was. Nobody on the earth spoke Hebrew. It was only like Latin in the sense of it was an academic language after the Jews were scattered. And so when the Jews regrouped in Israel, uh, Zionism, the the Jews migrating back to Israel, uh, it was uh, Theodore Herschel and others, Ben Yehuda. These guys, they they brought back the Jews and brought back the, the language of Hebrew from extinction. The Bible said that would happen. It's, it's amazing, the literal uh, unfolding of Bible prophecy. So the amillennialists, the preterists, those who take everything figuratively, I think that might be a big mistake as we're seeing very literal things unfold, like, uh, you know, for example, the Battle of Armageddon we're gonna study about in the book of Revelation. What's that? Well, basically, all the nations of the world are gonna come and they're gonna very much be against Israel. And all their guns will be pointing toward Israel. Uh, you know, again, a hundred years ago, people would say there is no literal uh, Jewish nation. There are no Jewish uh, Israelis. Uh, so that can't be a, a literal thing. But now, is anybody wondering if there's nations that don't like Israel? I mean, every day on the news, we see nations talking about blowing Israel off the map uh, with Iran and Syria and all these nations that are being very aggressive, the Hamas and the Hezbollah. Um, this is all what the Bible said would happen. In fact, the Battle of Armageddon, is really gonna be largely the nations pointing their weapons at Israel and that's when Christ is gonna return. I take that very literally. Uh, I'm just a literalist, uh, accuse me of being too much of a believer in little, literal things, but I have found that believing the Bible as literally as we can has been very rewarding. 
And uh, were, we find that so many prophecies are coming to pass. Even our president fulfills Bible prophecy. Did you know that? Uh, you can be happy. Our president is biblical. Uh, so is our, our uh, uh, you know, Secretary of State, biblical. Uh, you say, oh, great. That's wonderful, Brett. Yeah, because in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah chapter 14, it says that Israel in the last days, when the, just, just before the day of the Lord comes, the nations will seek to divide Israel in half. And the nations that do that will be handling a cup of trembling. Read Zechariah 12, read Zechariah 14. Uh, and you say, okay, well, who's doing that? Well, did you hear our president um, a few years ago say, we need to restore the borders that were in Israel pre-1967. He went on record saying, we need to go back to the 67 borders. And anybody who knows that, uh, which when we go to Israel, I'll show you the 67 borders that changed. We'll drive right through those streets. And you'll see it goes right down the middle of Jerusalem. It splits Jerusalem in half if you go back to the 67 borders, uh, which our president is calling for. Now, I'm, I'm being facetious that that's a good thing. <laughs> the nations that handle Israel and try to divide Jerusalem will be handling a cup of trembling. And we wonder why our nation seems to be trembling economically and, uh, and so many other reasons. I believe our relationship to Israel is very important. See, it's the amillennial view and the preterist view. Have you ever wondered how can churches and how can Christians say, whatever, Israel, we don't care, divide Israel. Uh, call for a Palestinian state, which means dividing Jerusalem in half. How can churches say that? If you're wondering, it's, it's because these views <clears throat> believe that pretty much God is done with the Jewish people because they forsook the Lord. And so they've replaced the Jewish uh, uh, blessing with the church, and it's called replacement theology. And a lot of times the preterist or the amillennialist uh, believe that the church has taken the place of the Jew. But if, if, if you're not careful, that can be very arrogant to say, we've replaced God's chosen people. I'm not willing to say that, not even close. In fact, Rome, uh, Romans chapter 11 says, don't be haughty, you Gentiles. Don't be arrogant, Gentiles, because the Lord does have a plan for Israel. Yes, they're sort of in uh, hibernation right now spiritually. They're blinded in part, the Bible says, but there's gonna come a day where their eyes will be opened, the Jewish people, and they'll see that they rejected the Messiah. When Jesus comes, they'll see, see him as the lamb that had been slain, and they'll say, where did you get those wounds? And Jesus will tell them, I got this, these wounds in the house of my friends. It's a radical story. But I believe that replacement theology is a, a very haughty and arrogant uh, type of view, and it's dangerous for you. I'll tell you why. If the Jews were forsaken by God because of bad behavior, what is keeping you from being forsaken by God? Because I would argue that you are probably worse than the Jews, and so am I. The Jews were sort of like the champions of righteousness. They were the ones who tried the hardest to keep the law of the, the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. And uh, they did a, as good of a job as I think any nation or group or people could have done. But the point of the law, the New Testament tells us, was to drive us, to drive us all to Jesus Christ, where there's forgiveness of sin. We have to be real careful because if the Lord says, well, those Jews, I'm just put off. I'm put out, I'm perturbed with those Jews, so I'm gonna choose the Christian church. Uh, if he forsook those guys, which he didn't, because he made, as the Old Testament says, an everlasting covenant with the Jews. Everlasting means everlasting, even when you look it up in the Hebrew. Uh, you don't wanna play with an everlasting promise that God has toward a people. That's why I'm very, very concerned about the preterist and the millennial views because it tends to be uh, uh, saying God is done with the Jews. And that's why as many good things as Martin Luther did in the Reformation, and I'm so appreciative of, one of the things that I'm sure uh, Martin Luther is really embarrassed about now that he's in heaven is he was an anti-Semite, radically. He spoke horribly evil things against the Jews. That's just the truth. Uh, as, as somewhat of a Martin Luther fan, that's the one area I kind of like to push in the back and say, uh, he didn't have a clue on the Jewish thing. That was a big goof. But I have to say, if I lived in his time, I might have been tempted to think the same way because it'd be hard to take the prophecies of the Bible literally because there, were, there, were no is, there was no Israel. Are you following me on that? Now, now that's the, the, 
the amillennial and preterist view. You don't take anything very literally. Uh, that, that, that's uh, one of those views. So you got post-millennialism, that is that Christ's return will come at the end of the millennial kingdom. You got amillennial, and that's where there's no literal millennium and no real literal translation, or, or, or I should say interpretation of, of the Bible prophecy. But then you have premillennial view. Uh, much of evangelical Christianity falls in that category of pre-millennial. That is, we believe that Christ is going to return just right at the beginning or prior to the thousand years that's called the millennial kingdom. That Jesus will come again and then he'll rule and reign over that millennial kingdom. So, so you know, the amillennial says, no, we're living in the kingdom right now. The, another problem I have with that is when I read about the kingdom period that's coming in the Bible... There's going to be some interesting characteristics. Can anybody, quiz time, can anybody tell me what's one of the characteristics of the millennial kingdom you read about in the Bible? That's the famous one, isn't it? The lion shall lie down with the lamb. Does that happen today? The lion lying down with the lamb? No, uh, only for dinner. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Lamb chops. Uh, that's not so good for the lamb, right? Uh, in the millennial kingdom, that's what's going to happen. It's gonna, there's going to be, you know, the fallen state of the world is gonna be repaired during the millennial kingdom. And you know, old things are gonna be passed away. There's gonna be newness and, and righteousness and purity brought in. What else is gonna happen in the millennial kingdom? Anybody? The devil's gonna be set straight What's that? The be yes, the devil, the devil, the Bible talks about that. We're gonna read about this in the book of Revelation. The devil will be uh, tied up for a t that thousand years of the millennial kingdom and his demons will be thrown into the, what is called the abuso, uh, the bottomless pit. Uh, he will be released at the end of the millennium for a very short season. And you say, why? Well, we'll get into that as we go through the book of Revelation. But see, the point is, uh, Daniel even talks about the millennial kingdom. And he says, the, during the millennium, there'll be an end of transgression, an end of sin. So as an amillennialist, you have to say, wow, uh, that's pretty optimistic to call that uh, we're in the millennium right now, because I don't see an end of sin. Question, is sin worse today than it was yesterday? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I'd be real depressed if I was a dominion theologian or, or kingdom now theologian because that, you're trying to bring the kingdom of God in right now with your efforts and energies, but we're failing on that. But see, the Bible says that things will get worse before they get better. So that's kind of an interesting thing. The, it's the premillennialist that believes that Christ is his second coming. Remember, his first coming was when he came as a baby born in Bethlehem. The second coming of Christ is when he comes and rules and reigns on this earth. And I believe it'll be for that thousand years where we will rule and reign with him. Under his authority, those of us that are Christians will be able to have some role in that millennial kingdom. Now, uh, you say, okay, but what about the, isn't that the rapture of the church? Don't be confused. The rapture of the church is different than the second coming. I want to remind you, the rapture is what we believe is where the church, those who are alive and remain, will be caught up. First Thessalonians chapter four, to meet Jesus in the air and we'll be with them from that point on. That's what the scriptures say in First Thessalonians chapter four. But the rapture of the church is not a coming of Christ. He never sets foot on ground, if you would, on the earth. But it, it, we go up to be with the Lord and that's where we'll ever be with the Lord after the rapture of the church. Uh, and we'll talk about the rapture in a second. But as far as uh, most of evangelical Christianity believes in a premillennial view that there's a, uh, you know, a, a millennium, a, a thousand year period, and just before that, Christ is gonna return and rule and reign during that millennial kingdom. Well, what about after the millennial kingdom? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So then, then the question is, if you're a premillennialist, uh, of those three views, those are the three big ones, amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, most of evangelical Christians are uh, premillennial in view. Now, as we're all singing Kumbaya, saying pre-millennial, yeah. Within that group, there's <clears throat> three major divisions. <laughs> uh, and it's all good, it's all good. It's a good, good topic of discussion. But <clears throat> what you'll hear about those is you'll hear pre-trib, post-trib, and mid-trib. Uh, you might add a fourth one uh, because the pre-wrath people don't like to be called mid-tribbers and, and I understand why. Uh, there's pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, and pre-trib. What's all that, Brett? I'm confused. Well, this relates to the tribulation period, that seven-year period that we read about in Daniel. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24. It's mentioned many times in the book of Revelation. Seven-year period called the tribulation. It's got several names. The time of the wrath of the Lamb. 
ooh, scary, the wrath of the lamb. <laughs> Run for your lives, you know what I'm saying? It's like the wrath of the lamb. You gotta remember, it's speaking of the lamb of God. Jesus Christ is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and it's gonna be uh, horrifying. Uh, we'll, we'll, if, as we get through the book of Revelation, you'll see what I'm talking about. So, so in the, in the pre-millennial group, those, those three or four main camps, let's talk about those. First of all, post-trib. Some Christians believe that the rapture of the church will happen at the end of that seven-year period. They believe there's the seven-year period of tribulation on earth. And, and, and again, the time of the wrath of the Lamb where God pours out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting, sinful world. Um, doom and gloom, bread, I knew it. When we get into the book of Revelation, you're gonna talk about wrath and fire and brimstone and hailstones pounding people on the heads and death, pestilence, famine, disease. It's all the book of Revelation, it's horrible. No, it is, it, there are horrible things, but, but you have to understand that's the black backdrop that's dark and gloomy that's gonna to point to the coming of Christ, which is gonna bring the brightness of glory and, and it's something that we're gonna be able to look forward to and be comforted with. But the big debate in premillennial is when's the rapture? Is it before the tribulation? Is it the middle of the tribulation? Or is it the end of the tribulation? Which one? So the post-tribbers say, you know, we're gonna have to go through the tribulation. So, you know, prepare yourself, brace yourself. Uh, some of my post-millennial friends, or pardon me, post-trib friends, um, as much as uh, I love them, uh, some of them are a little kooky when it comes to bunkers, guns, and Cheerios, and uh, canned foods, and stuff like that. Um, and by the way, even if I were a post-tribber, I'd be uh, you know, hesitant to go too nuts with the whole preparation, because if the world is as bad as it says it's gonna get, your little bunker's not gonna hold up. And what are you gonna do when people are pounding on your bunker saying, please, we're hungry, will you feed us? And you open the door, boom, God bless you. Is that what you're gonna do? I mean, is, is that Christian behavior to blow away your neighbor who's starving because they want your food? Uh, I understand what those guys are all saying, but I just don't see Christ really blowing away the neighbors because they're hungry and stuff like that. So it is funny. Now, I'm not saying all post-tribbers are like that. That's, that would be unfair for me to characterize all post-tribbers, uh, but th that there are some that kind of do that. If you see a person who's a uh, Christian who's getting their bunker all together, it's possible and likely that they do believe in a post-trib view because um, uh, you have to go through the tribulation. The mid-trib people and the, and the pre-wrath, uh, they believe the rapture of the church is gonna happen, uh, the mid-tribbers say right in the middle of the tribulation, but the pre-wrath people say somewhere before the, the middle or prior, prior to the middle of the tri tribulation, the middle of the tribulation. And the reason they say that is, um, in, in their defense, honestly, pre-wrathers, uh, is the Bible does divide the, the tribulation into two sections, the first three and a half years and the last three and a half years. And it's all called the tribulation, but the last three and a half years, Jesus seems to call that the great tribulation. Uh, it is gonna be worse. The, the last three and a half years are in fact gonna be worse than the first three and a half years. And so the pre-wrathler says, before all that hardcore wrath is poured out, the church will be raptured. And, uh, and I agree with the pre-wrathlers in that I don't believe that we are, as Christians are appointed to wrath. Um, but as I read, the, the story of the tribulation, as I read it, I realize the whole seven years is gonna be horrible. Oh yeah, the last are gonna be terrible, but, but the first three and a half are not like a walk in the park. There's gonna be at least one third of the people on the population of the earth will die during that first three and a half years. We'll see that as we get in the book of Revelation. That's not gonna be pleasant, not gonna be fun. Uh, yay, we're waiting for the rapture during that time. <clears throat> but I'm gonna show you reasons why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. So you got the pre-wrath, pre mid-trib, the post-trib, but the pre-trib rapture believes simply that the next event on the prophetic timeline that we are gonna see is the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church happens, that's when the tribulation period gets kicked into gear. That's when those seven years start. That's where uh, all of Revelation chapter six through 19 is gonna um, uh, kind of unfold. And it's gonna be a horrible time to be on this planet. Now, my post-trib and mid-trib and pre-wrath people, they're, they're always saying, Brett, you just wanna escape the tribulation. You're just trying to you know, keep us all out of the tribulation. And my answer to that is absolutely. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Uh, and you say, well, Brett, that's not a good reason. Well, Jesus said this. He said, pray that you be counted worthy to escape all these things. When he was talking about the tribulation period, he says, be, you know, pray that you be uh, able to escape. And so that's what I pray for. And I pray for a pre-trib rapture. 
But I, I, I don't just pray and hope for it. I, I believe it biblically makes the most sense. So you got the pre-trib, the mid-trib, the pre-wrath, uh, and the post-trib, all those different views. Um, now, you say, Brett, I happen to believe this or that or the other. Well, let me show you just one reason. I've got a, a ton of reasons why I'm a pre-trib, pre-millennial person, but let me just show you something, and this is gonna help us with the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter one, let's like, take a look at verse 19. You say, finally, he's getting to the scripture. <laughs> uh, there we read in Revelation 1, 19, John is, of course, receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ, and Jesus tells him, Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, many people would blow through this and say, okay, write down stuff, right? Isn't that what it's saying? But I think you miss something giant. You see, Re Revelation is unique in that it comes with its own blessing. Remember, we learned that a couple weeks ago, that it's the only book of the Bible that says, man, if you read this, if you hear this, if you keep the words of this prophecy, you're gonna be blessed. Uh, Revelation uniquely comes with that blessing. I'm still marveling that churches blow off the book of Revelation because it's too difficult to understand. And so they miss a blessing. Hey, if I'm Satan, you know, some of you are like, it's possible. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm Satan, uh, I'd want people not that, to have that blessing. So I would whisper in people's ears, say, ah, oh, you don't want to read the book of Revelation. It's too crazy. It's too difficult to understand all that imagery and uh, those, the kind of language that's used and uh, the horror of Babylon. Oh, you can't talk about that in church. And, and, and I, I, if I'm Satan, I want people to avoid the book of blessing. You know what I'm talking about? And isn't it sad that really, by and large, unless you're a verse by verse through the Bible type of teaching church, you're gonna avoid the book of Revelation. One thing you'll find, by the way, is the churches that teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Uh, I think book by book is kind of, kind of cool too. Not just, I know there's good churches that teach just topically. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but I've found that, man, you don't skip stuff. Especially when you go book by book, you just kind of cover everything. Whether you like it or not, you cover the whole scriptures. That's what I love to do. Um, and I think pastors are kind of intimidated by that. But let me just say this. The churches that are pre-trib, pre-millennial are also the churches that are going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the Bible. Uh, it's, you'll, it's very hard. I don't even know if I've heard of a church existing that teaches book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that is anything but pre-trib, pre-millennial. And let me just tell you why I believe that to be true. It's because when you go through the scriptures verse by verse, you, you've got to be able to explain what you were, and, and it's got to fit what you were talking about last week and the week before and the week before. You see, as a church goes through the Bible, everything kind of needs to fit together and, and it needs to be congruent. There, there shouldn't be any con conflicts one of the easiest ways to interpret Bible prophecy and the way it all fits together, whether in Matthew 24, Daniel chapter nine, Revelation chapter one, the, the one of the easiest ways to see how it all fits together is to have that pre-trib, pre-millennial view. If you're a amillennialist, man, you gotta do some fancy structure work and you have to know the Greek and the Hebrew to the point where you can't understand it unless you really know what I alone happen to know. It's very esoteric. Uh, and uh, it's the pre-trib, pre-millennial view that says, man, you just read your Bible as it sits and it'll make sense. And, and, and the book of Revelation will in fact fit with Daniel and what Jesus had to say in Matthew 24. Um, and I believe that's the secret of understanding the book of Revelation is to take the book as it sits. And, it, and it not only does it come with this unique divine blessing, it also comes with its unique divine, God-given, God-inspired outline. And it's the verse that we just read. It's a very easy outline of the book. What is that? Right. The things which thou hast seen, number one. Number two, write the things that are. And number three, write the things that shall be hereafter. Let me break that down in those three things. And uh, if you're taking notes, you can jot them down. But this is something that if you wanna understand the book of Revelation, understand this, this is, this is essential. John is told, number one, write the things which thou hast seen. Here's the question. What has John seen up to this point? 
That's it, right? You get an A. Jesus, uh, chapter one is the things which he's already seen. He's already seen a beautiful and glorious vision of Jesus Christ. And we, we looked at that last Sunday and the Sunday before. And the Wednesday, a couple Wednesdays before, we saw Jesus as des- described for us as the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, which means he's the resurrected one. We saw Jesus in chapter uh, one, verse five and six as the, the one who's made us a kingdom of priests. Um, and we've also seen him described as the one who's washed us from our sins in his own blood. But then we saw also in verses 13 through 16, this glorious vision of Christ. And, uh, and we talked about that. Was that last Sunday, I think, where uh, we talked about the sword coming out of the mouth and the white hair and the fire eyes. And I gave you the admonition, don't go home and paint this because uh, it's an ugly painting, literally. But each of these things have meaning uh, spiritually and how important that is to see what those meanings are. And we looked at that. And it makes Jesus... It just glow with glory as we read that. And what a beautiful picture of Christ it was. So, so when John is told by, by the Lord, now, John, write the things which you have seen, that's chapter one. In our divine outline that's God given, it, it says, man, chapter one is point number one, the things which thou hast seen, Jesus Christ. You could make an argument that John has also seen Jesus in a literal friendship way as he walked with Christ on earth. So write those things which I have seen. But the second point, number two, is he says, and write the things which are present day. So what does John do? Well, as you read through, chapter one is about Jesus, but the things that are, well, it moves right into the things that are, the church age, the church era. We're gonna see the next couple of chapters that we're gonna start on Wednesday night, the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. What a rewarding study the study of the seven churches will be. You see, because it's multi-layered. It's like the onion as you peel back the layers. That's what the seven churches are because it is, in fact, about seven literal churches of Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey. Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamos, Laodicea, uh, you know, Philadelphia, all these different churches that are listed there. They're part of literal churches of Asia Minor. And that's to be taken quite literally, but you'll also realize as you read it, and we're gonna see that the Lord puts for us these seven churches that will also speak of church history. It's a panoramic view of all that has happened throughout the ages in the church of Jesus Christ. Now remember, if you're kind of new to this, that when did the church age begin? Uh, before the church age, it was the Old Testament era, if you would, of the Jews who were under the law. But Jesus came and fulfilled the law perfectly. Jesus wasn't one who satisfied the demands of the law and for humanity died on the cross so that the law drives us to Christ. And when Christ died on the cross, rose from the grave and ascended into heaven, the church age began. That is not just Jews, but like Ephesians 2 says, no longer is it Jews or Gentiles, non-Jews. But he says, we've seen in Ephesians chapter two, one new man, What was that new man? The church. The person who's Jew or Gentile who believes the Messiah of the Jews, by the way. Uh, I like to remind the people who don't believe that God still loves the Jews and has a plan for the Jews. We have the Jews to thank for our Messiah. Don't forget that. Jesus, the Messiah, was a Jew. And uh, he saves all the world, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. One new man, that's called the church. Now there's names for the church. One of the biggest names I love uh, is the bride of Christ. We are called the bride of Christ, the church. That's an important thing to remember. So this church age, he says, John, write the things that are. And I believe he's speaking of that entire age as John was close to 100 years old probably when he received this vision of revelation on the island of Patmos, the church has already started to boom all over Asia Minor, even in Rome and in Jerusalem and, and, some, and uh, some, uh, Samaria, that whole region of Judea. The church has started to grow. It was growing like wildfire. And so John's saying, okay, I'm gonna write the things that are. The church age, it's very clear. And we're gonna see in chapter two and three, just that. But then, Point number three on the outline that's given by God here, write the things which are, chapter one. Write the things, pardon me, the things which you've seen, chapter one. And then write the things that are, chapter two and three, the church age. And then he says, and then write the things 
point number three, that shall be hereafter. Now, there's an interesting Greek uh, word pair there that you should know. When it says hereafter in your King James, or what is it, after those things, after these things, uh, in some of your newer translations, the, the Greek word is meta tauta. Uh, it's, the, the manuscript is metahauta, if you were looking for it. Uh, but metatauta is the, the word, and you say, okay, so whatever. But you have to understand metatauta is sort of a flag that has even maybe a little more meaning than just after these things in general, but it's very specific in chron- chronological order is the idea. So after the church age, what, what, what's next? Well, I told you that chapter one's the things that she's already seen, Jesus. Chapter two and three, the things that are, the church age, that's the current age we live. Question, by the way, when is the end of the church age? You have to kind of think about this, but uh, for those that believe in a rapture, uh, you, you realize the rapture of the church is kind of the end of the church age, isn't it? Uh, that's, that's the end, and it's called the fullness of the Gentiles. Uh, I believe that's one of those other terms you'll come up in the Bible. So this church age will end, I believe, with the rapture of the church. Uh, as a pre-trib rapture person, that's what I believe. And, and even your uh, pre-millennials will agree, the end of the church age will be the rapture of the church. So all the pre-millennials, post-trib, mid-trib, uh, amil, sawmill, all the different views. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say that. The amillennials, many of them don't believe in a literal rapture at all, uh, which is unfortunate, because when they're raptured, it's gonna be a big shock. Um, but, but, but all that to say, uh, you know, here he's going to write the things which shall be hereafter meta tauta. Now, now follow with me. Chapter one, Jesus. Chapter two and three, things which are the church. Turn with me to chapter four. Let's see what it says there. Revelation chapter four. It says, of course, you got all the churches in chapter two and three, and then you move into chapter four, and it says in verse one, after this, can you guess what the Greek word is there for after this? Metatauta. So write the things which shall be hereafter, after these things. After what things? After the church age, the things which are. Then after this, chapter four, I looked and behold, a door was opened into heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Question, who had the voice of a trumpet in our previous study? Jesus, remember he heard the voice of a trumpet, turned around and looked and he saw Jesus. So the voice of this trumpet calls out, the door of heaven's opening up and, and what does it say? It says, this voice of the trumpet that was talking with me, which said, come up hither. What does that remind you of, anybody? The rapture of the church. Here's the voice of heaven, door of heaven, opening up the voice calling out and sounding like a trumpet and suddenly he's going up into heaven. That very much sounds very rapture-esque, even if you don't believe in the rapture. Why, why don't people believe in the rapture? It's interesting because they'll say, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. And that is correct. Neither is the word Trinity. But most of them would agree that the Bible does teach us of a Trinity, for sure. But listen, this is first, uh, stay where you are there in Revelation, but this is First Thessalonians 4. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel with the trump of God. So we got a trumpet blowing and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a description of what we would call the rapture of the church. The word caught up in the English is translated from, to, from a Greek word called harpazo. The Greek word was translated into the Latin Vulgate as the word rapture. That's where the word rapture comes from. It was the Latin Vulgate that they kind of, that word sort of stuck but you can call it whatever you want, being zipped up into heaven or caught up or harpazoed or whatever you want to do, whatever you want to call it. So some people say the rapture is not even in the Bible. First Thessalonians is one of those places of, among many that speak of the rapture where the church will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. So back to Revelation 4.1, you see this metatout to after the churches of two and three in chapter four, then we have this coming up into heaven. And he says, I'll show the things which must be Hereafter, again, metatauta. So it is the pre-trib, pre-millennial view that says, we just take the book of Revelation as it's laid out very naturally. The greatest part of being a pre-tribber 
premillennialist is we don't have to juggle the book of Revelation and try to take chapter three and move it over to chapter six and chapter five over. You don't have to jumble it all up. Uh, in fact, it's the preterists and the amillennials who, uh, when they believe those, some of those things have already been fulfilled, you really have to juggle the book around and make it all, it it's a, becomes this exercise of um, like uh, unscram, uh, unscrambling the book of Revelation. That's why people say it's too difficult, it's too hard, because you have to juggle it around. The pre-trib, pre-millennial view says, no, let the book of Revelation lie as it sits. Because John writes, number one, the things that he's already seen, Jesus, chapter one. Then he writes about the things that are present day, the church age, the seven churches. And we're gonna see not only those literal churches, but the panoramic view of church history from the beginning all the way to the present day of the church age. We're gonna see that in those seven churches. But then write the things which shall be meta to after these things. And so I believe chapter four to the end of the book of Revelation speaks of the future and what's gonna happen at the end of the world. It's very simple if you look at it that way. And by the way, it all comes out in order even with that. What do you mean? Well, check this out. Since you're already there in chapter four, uh, look what it says there. Uh, so he's caught up into heaven, uh, we're told. And what does he see? Immediately, verse two, I was in the spirit and the, behold, the throne was set in heaven and one who sat upon the throne. And it talks about what that looked like. And round about the throne, verse four, the, there were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Uh, look at verse five. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings, voices. And there were, hmm, seven lamps. Uh, that should bring back some interesting imagery that we've already covered. Uh, of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We've already talked about this in chapter one. Now, don't forget, we'll cover all this as we go through this. I'm just giving you a sneak preview. But chapters four and five are a heavenly scene. We see what's going on in heaven. And I believe it's an indication that the church is in heaven right here because we see the seven lamps. And the Bible says the lamps or the candlesticks uh, are the seven churches and they're represented also by the seven spirits of God. But if you don't like that imagery, look at chapter five real, real quick. Verse, verse, chapter five is also the same heavenly scene. It says in verse nine, they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, um, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. Question, who are those that were redeemed? Well, some, well, that must be the Jews. Yeah, but it says here, out of every tongue, kindred, nation, uh, and people. There's only one group of people that have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb uh, and taken out of every nation, and that is the church of Jesus Christ. The point is, we're gonna see that we have this, after this, after the church age, we see the heavenly scene and guess who's there? Safely deposited in heaven, worshiping before the throne. You see the church in heaven. Meanwhile, back at the hall of justice <laughs> on earth. What's going on on earth? You got in heaven, you got the church after this metatauta. But what about the earth? What's going on there? That's where chapter six picks up. And what you see there is the tribulation period starting to unfold. You got the four horsemen, you got horrible things starting to happen. And right at the beginning in, of the tribulation, what happens? Flip over to page, uh, or chapter six. Just flip the page to chapter six, where it says in verse 15. And then for you pre-wrath people, uh, if you take the book of Revelation as it sits, this is toward the beginning of the tribulation after the four horsemen. And notice what it says in verse 15, and the kings of the earth and the great men and rich men, Donald Trump and those guys, um, <laughs> the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and free man hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? That's the wrath, that's the tribulation period kicked into gear. And it starts in chapter six and goes all the way through chapter 19. You say, well, what about chapter 19? Well, then the second coming of Christ. So you had the rapture of the church, which kicks off the tribulation period, seven years. 
as the book of Revelation just naturally lies out there. And then in chapter 19, you have Christ's return. And he comes with who? Us, 10,000s of his saints in chapter 19, we're gonna read. Um, by the way, if you're a post-tribber, what's the point of the rapture? I call it the Malaboomer. I guess that ride uh, is no longer at Disneyland. What a bummer. You remember the ride where you go up, and then you come back down. Uh, that, I always wondered what the post-trib rapture view, like why are you raptured? You go up with the Lord and then you come back down with the Lord. Uh, and it seems like there's no time uh, in between. The rapture of the church in the, before the tribulation, I believe serves a perf- purpose. We are the bride of Christ. Christ takes his bride for seven years. You Jewish wedding specialists know that that's key, that the Lord takes his bride, his church away. By the way, if you're gonna get married, and you know that trouble's coming and you have the opportunity to pull your bride, you guys, before you're married, pull your bride out of great trouble and protect her from that. And you have the ability to do that. Would you do it? Or would you say, no, honey, poopsie. Uh, You need to go through all the trials and troubles and we'll get married at the end of all that horrible time when people are dying all around you and stuff, but you'll make it and and, uh, we'll get married after that. Uh, Wouldn't you ladies just go, oh, I'm so in love. See. I believe the rapture of the church is Christ pulling out his bride before the wrath of God is coming down on the earth. It makes perfect sense just in God's nature and character to have his church go through the tribulation. Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 says, we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, I believe it's wrong to consider the church going through the tribulation because guess what? Christ went through tribulation, if you would, for you, in that he died on the cross for our sins so that we would not have to be punished for our sins. The tribulation is a time where God's pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. Anybody who wants to be saved can believe in Jesus Christ, call out his name and confess with their mouth, repent from their sins and say, I'm a sinner who needs to be saved. And if you confess and believe, the Bible says you will be saved whether that's by the rapture of the church or should you die on your way home from church today. If you've confessed and believed the work of Christ, you will be not appointed unto the wrath of hell and death and judgment and damnation, which is in fact coming, contrary to what popular uh, pastors are trying to teach today. Death and hell, it's real. The Bible talks more about hell than it talks about heaven. But the gift of God is this salvation that you've never earned, you've never deserved, And I believe you, should you die, if you're a Christian, you're saved from the punishment of hell. Why would God put his church through punishment when he took the punishment for them? See, this is where when we start talking about Bible prophecy, you can talk about amillennial, premillennial, post-trib, pre-wrath, you can get into all that stuff. But at at, at the end of the discussion, one of the things we all generally agree in is that Jesus took our punishment on the cross. And, and of all the things of prophecy, when, when people get all freaked out, man, I'm worried about the tribulation and all this stuff, I don't believe we were meant to worry. In fact, in First Thessalonians 4 and 5, the Lord says, when you talk about these things, comfort one another with these words that you are not appointed unto wrath. So you got chapter 6 through 19, Then in chapter 19, you have the return of Christ with 10,000 of his saints. And then in chapters 20 and 21, uh, you've you've got this beautiful uh, picture of the millennial kingdom and how it's set up and all that stuff uh, in chapters 20 and 21. And then uh, 21 and 22, you see a new heaven and a new earth, and we all live happily ever after at that point. Uh, And that's where all the Uh, views of Bible prophecy and the discussion will end. And so people uh, say, oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. You're right. But, but, But it'll all end good for the believer. So write the things which you've seen. Where was that? Jesus in chapter one. Then write the things that are present day, uh, John's time and our time. What age was that? The church age in chapters two and three. But then you've got, write the things which shall be metatow to after these things. And that starts in chapter four. And the first thing we see after the the rapture of the church, uh, where the church is taken up, you see in chapter four and five, what do you see there? Heaven. And who's there? We are. 
We're pictured there with Jesus in heaven. And meanwhile, on earth, we see the tribulation kick into gear. Chapters 6 through 19 explains that. In chapter 19, you have the, the uh, return of Christ, which is the second coming. And then uh, you have that millennial kingdom kick into gear. A thousand years of the Lord ruling and reigning on the earth. And then you'll see after that thousand years, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. And then you'll see the new heavens and the new earth. That's the order. You see, that's why Revelation is in fact very, very simple. It's not hard if you just take it it, it, it'd be like you trying to read a great novel, only you take the chapters and jumble them all up and then try to make sense of it. That's what, sadly, a lot of the eschatological views do. You can't take the book of Revelation as it, it lies perfectly. If you do what it just does here and you take chapter 1, verse 19, as its divine outline, you'll see how it perfectly unfolds. But the main thing I want to leave you with is, man, the wrath that was meant for you that we're gonna see poured out. You see, when I read Revelation 6 through 19, I do get bummed out because it is sad to see what's gonna happen when the wrath is poured out. But it does a couple things for me. One, it makes me glad that I'm not appointed under wrath, that Christ took my punishment on the cross so I wouldn't have to. But number two, it makes me wanna share the gospel with as many people as I possibly can. It's one of the reasons why every Sunday I present the gospel. I've already given it a couple times today, if you didn't notice that we're all sinners, we need to repent from our sins, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus died, rose from the grave, and forgives you for all your sins, the Bible says you will be saved. It's so beautiful. So I thought it'd be appropriate. I know it's a little, little bit late, but uh, I'd like to just have us close with a time of remembering the wrath that was meant for you. Uh, was taken on the cross. And it's really a celebration for us to go to the table of communion. And I'd love for you to join me in just a, just a couple songs and we'll close and then we'll uh, dismiss you and you can head out. But first, if you don't know if you're a Christian, I wanna encourage you to become a Christian today. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Um, I'm gonna have a few of my pastor friends uh, here on, that are on staff and some of the elders and guys, they'll be hanging out up against that back wall right there, just up against the wall. If their back's to that wall and they're just standing there looking like they have nothing to do, they're looking for you to come and be prayed for, to talk to them. If you need prayer for anything, man, those guys would love to uh, uh, pray with you and have you accept Christ. And then you could come and you could... Uh, eat of this little bread, drink of this cup. And what that is is simply the bread is a symbol of his body that was broken for us, bruised. The wrath that was meant for you and me was taken and that bread, we, we eat that and realize his, his body endured our pain. And then the cup is the blood of Christ. We read in Revelation 1, it's the blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow and cleanses us from all our sins. So when you come to the table, Christians, be repentant, confess your sins that you've committed, um, in this recent times of your life. Because once you become a Christian, doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect. Very far from that. But you are perfectly forgiven for all your sins. And that's what we do. We celebrate forgiveness of sin. When you get up from these tables, as you kneel down and eat of the Lord and just commune with him, when you get up, you can know your sins are forgiven and you're, they're remembered no more. And you don't have to be condemned or feel guilty, but you can go your way and you don't have to be tangled up in sin. You're free to not sin. What a glorious thing that is. So I want you to come. Let's pray together. Lord, we do ask that as we gather in your name, that Father, you would be honored at these tables. Lord, I pray that we'd come with real reverence in our hearts, that we'd come with true hearts to worship. Lord, for those who are tired and weary from their sins, Lord, you do say in your word, the way of the transgressor is hard. But I would pray, Lord, that as we confess our sins at this table of communion, that you'd lift that burden, the guilt, the condemnation off, and that your kindness would truly lead us to repentance. So be honored today. We give this time of worship to you. In Jesus' name.